All right, well, good morning. I want to welcome you um, to our time here at Malin Baptist Church. We're excited about continuing our journey um, through the book of Hebrews. If you could go ahead and open up to Hebrews chapter 11, we'll get started here in just a second. All right, so we're going to continue our journey here through the Hall of Faith um, today. Um, As we've journeyed through the Hall of Faith here in Hebrews, we've been reminded of two men uh, who lived before the flood. Uh, The first was Abel, uh, and then we covered the life of Enoch, a man who walked with God. And then we covered one man whose life spanned uh, a, a cataclysmic event here in the world where the world was never the same. That was Noah through the flood. Um, Then we started down the family tree of faith, right? And we've covered great-grandpa Abraham, and then uh, grandfather Isaac, his father Jacob, right? And then down to the son Joseph, that favored son Joseph. And during this process, um, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob promised to take the family lineage, this family lineage, and turn them into a mighty nation, Uh, By the time Joseph arrives, though, on the scene, God's promises to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob have uh, begun to bear visible fruit, okay? Now, if you're interested in watching an an incredible documentary uh, verifying God's word and specifically the life of Joseph and his brothers and how they did exist in the nation of Egypt and how they've uncovered archaeological remains of their tombs, all this sort of thing, um, you can watch uh, this Patterns of the Evidence, Exodus, uh, it's available on almost every major platform for streaming um, television. You can also catch some glimpses of it on on YouTube. But if you're interested in seeing that uh, the Bible is not just a made-up fairy tale, but it's reality, it's truth, it really did happen, um, you can uh, watch this documentary. It's it's a really well-done one. Um, But anyway, Joseph, who we covered last week, he died at a ripe old age of 110. And shortly after Joseph died... Uh, There was a baby boom that puts the baby boomers of the 50s and the 60s and the millennials of the 80s and the 90s to shame. Uh, We read about it in Exodus chapter 1, verse 7, and it says this. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and they grew exceedingly strong so that the land of Egypt was filled with them. So the issue is, is Egypt is being overrun by what's now the Israelites. Remember, Jacob's name is uh, changed by God to Israel, and that's where Israelites come from. However, there's a problem. There's a new Pharaoh who eventually arises in Egypt who didn't know Joseph. And we catch up with that in Exodus chapter 1, verses 8 through 11, and it says this. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let's deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. Now, here in this one little section of scripture, we see a partial fulfillment of God's prophecy that he made, again, to great-grandpa Abraham. Okay? And we... We're going to read it again. We read it last week as well, but it's significant. Genesis chapter 15, verse 12 through 13. God appears to Abraham before Abraham has a single descendant to call his own. And the Lord says this, The sun was going down and a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain, your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and they'll be servants there. And they will be afflicted for 400 years. Now, here we see in this section as we journey through the end of Joseph's life and on into Moses, we see God's word literally fulfilled. 
And I want to spend just briefly a little bit of time on the importance of Bible prophecy this morning. Uh, This thing, Bible prophecy, is one of the main things that we can point to that verifies and validates that this book here, which hopefully you hold in your hands in some format or another, is not just some book. This is the book of God. This is God's word to us. And Bible prophecy proves the divine nature of this book. It's one of the main ways that we prove it. There is no other religious book in the world that does the same thing that this book does. Absolutely none. Now, when God makes a promise in the Bible, his prophecy, he intends to keep them. And he does every single time. We read in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, uh, this great section here. It says, We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you would do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in our hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So, in reality, it's this section of the Bible. When we think about Bible prophecy, it's what makes the Bible unique. It's the only book in the world where God says, hey, I'm going to do this. And what do you know? It happens. Okay? We see this begin to take place here as we're journeying between Joseph and Moses. Uh, will Will we have faith in the prophecies of God, in his word, or not? Normal men and women listed here in the Hall of Faith did. Um, Becky, would you uh, read Hebrews 11.1 for us, please? Basic confidence that we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Okay, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So God prophesied to Abraham that his descendants, of which, again, there were none at the time, would eventually be sojourners in a land where they would become slaves and they would be afflicted for 400 years. God promised it, and that's exactly what happened. However, there's more to God's promise to Abraham. God also said this in Genesis chapter 15, verse 14, the next sentence in that passage we read before. He says, But I will bring judgment on that nation that they serve after 400 years, And afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. So it wasn't just that God, uh, he didn't just mean to keep the first portion of the prophecy, but the rest of it as well. So for God to fulfill this part, this deliverance portion of it, he chose to appoint a revolutionary leader for the new nation of Israel. That leader is the next inductee here in the Hall of Faith, and it's the man Moses. Now, I was thinking about this. How significant is this one man, Moses. Not just to the Hebrews, not just to Jews, not just to the nation of Israel, but to all of Christianity. The reality is, he is extremely important. It would be difficult, in my opinion, to underestimate the importance of Moses. In fact, I think you could make an argument that of all the mortal men, not we're excluding Jesus, right? He's God in the flesh, but in fact, of all the mortal men to ever live, Moses is quite possibly the most important man who ever lived. Until now, of all the members here in the Hall of Faith, we highlighted how Abraham's life was very significant. I was thinking about it. I checked it out. Again, Abraham is mentioned 234 uh, in 234 different verses in the Bible. Moses is mentioned 796 times. That's over a 300% increase, okay? Abraham actually receives the most ink here, though, in Hebrews 11, but Moses, when you look at the the Bible, the entire Bible, he gets by far the most press. Um, Abraham received 13 chapters in Genesis. Moses wrote Genesis, right? In fact... The Bible says that Moses is the author of the first five books of the Bible, right? That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay, these these, uh, books here form the foundation 
for everything that we believe and understand about what God says in his word. The Bible, I looked it up, is over 600,000 words long in its original languages. The Torah, or the first five books of Moses, that's what the Jews call the first five books, it contains 125,000 words. So if you figure that out, the first five books of Moses comprises one-fifth of the entire Bible. That's 20%. So how important are these first five books and this man, Moses? Not only that, but Moses' books, again, are the foundation for our faith. I would say to you that the Bible is extremely difficult to understand if you've never taken the time to read these first five books. It's easy to get lost. It's like thinking about building a house without a foundation. Um, If you don't have a working understanding of the first five books, Uh, then it's easy to fall or fail to understand much of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, certainly all the other books in the New Testament, certainly the book of Hebrews, right, that we're in now. So if you haven't read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, even Leviticus, okay, you should. You should. It's the foundation for so much of what we believe and understand. It forms the foundation for all the rest of what's in this book. Moses wrote these books. Now, we pick it up in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verse 23 through 28. This is the section that speaks about Moses, and it says this. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful, and they weren't afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, Moses kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. Let me pray. Father, first of all, this is true. We stand and sit here today, and we hold in our hands the word of God. It's truth. It's absolute truth. God, we have this privilege today to not just hold truth in our hands, but the truth that we hold in our hands tells us of the depth of your love for us. Your desire to redeem us, God, from the slavery of sin. To deliver us, Lord, like Moses, into the promised land of forgiveness and relationship and eternal life with Christ. Lord, as we spend time today, as your kids, holding this this book, holding these words, thinking about you. We invite you, Holy Spirit, come, speak to us, reveal more of yourself to us, God, that we might walk, each of us, individually, more closely with you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So here in verse, 20, uh, verse 23, the writer of Hebrews seeks to emphasize the significance of Moses' birth. That's what he talks about. So what's so special Big whoop. What's the big deal about Moses' birth? Well, first, Moses' birth was an act of faith in God and defiance of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh thought he was God. Okay? Uh, Pharaoh, if you read the first uh, chapter of Exodus, Pharaoh saw that the Israelites were multiplying faster than rabbits. And so naturally, he grew concerned about the welfare of his country. If these Israelite slaves ever realized that they had power in numbers and they chose to rebel. So he ordered the Hebrew midwives, if you go read the story in Exodus 1, to slaughter all the newborn males. As soon as they were born, kill them. Then, when the midwives were unwilling, Pharaoh decided he would just use his army to capture the firstborn, any males born, and drown them in the Nile River. Throw babies into the Nile River, okay? Now, does that sound familiar? Well, it should. 
Because I was thinking about it today, as we look at the life of Moses back then, God is calling him out of Egypt, okay? And we're going to focus briefly on some striking similarities today between Moses and using Moses to call the Egyptians or the Israelites out of Egypt and God calling us to lead people out of slavery and sin here in our day and age in America, okay? Some correlations between Egypt and America. Well, first of all, it's, there's a really easy one to grab onto, and it's abortion. In America, as of 2018, we've slaughtered over 61 million babies. On average, I looked it up, 18.5% of would-be American boys and girls are murdered before they ever take their first breath. So it's not just back in the day in Egypt, same sin, same nonsense happening in our world, in our own country. Um, in Moses' time, a ruler arose who didn't know Joseph. Um, in our time, in our day and age, we live right now as a post-Christian nation. Rulers have arisen who don't know Jesus. We have entire generations now of young people in our nation who don't know anything about Jesus. Also, Pharaoh succeeded and he grew in, in power on the backs of slaves. Now, I love the United States of America. I'm very patriotic. But we've got our own um, junk in the woodpile too, right? And we've advanced our own nation and built our own nation on the back of slavery in the past. But it isn't just in the past either. Currently, right now in the United States, sex trafficking is one of the main forms of slavery in the U.S. right now. In fact, just half a mile that direction, California is uh, the worst state in the United States for sex trafficking. Modern day slavery. So it isn't just what's going on, what we read in the past. It's also what's going on in the present. And will we, how are we going to respond? Will we be like Moses? Also, Pharaoh sought to change the direction of Egypt by targeting its youth. Um, in America, we've been living under 100 years. It's over 100 years now of a targeted humanist agenda to change the mindset and makeup of youth through the education system. It's just true. So it wasn't just Pharaoh back in the day. Also, finally notice how Pharaoh attacked children's gender. I was thinking about this. In our media today, we currently press this absurd agenda that formalized gender doesn't exist. That we're not just male and female. So even if a child is born, the hope is that he or she will never discover their true identity as a man or a woman of God. Now, regardless of whether it seems absurd or not to you, there's a lot of people that are living out in this section here that are struggling. And the struggle that they deal with and the confusion that they feel is real. And we don't need to make fun of that or ridicule that. But we also need to walk in the truth and the reality of what God said. In the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 27, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, if we have an issue with that, we have to take it up with God, because that's what God said. We don't get to redefine truth. What God said is reality, and we need to live within that reality. Um, all that to say, though, that the story of Moses is extremely applicable to us still today. By faith, will we follow in the footsteps of Moses and be willing to lead our own nation in an exodus out of slavery to, this, uh, slavery to sin to the promised land of true freedom in Christ. Moses' parents decide that they're going to rebel against Pharaoh. Okay, So they hid Moses for three months until they could hide him no longer. Then by faith, and you want to talk about enormous faith, Moses' parents, we know their names, it's Amram and Jochebed, they placed Moses into a homemade floating bassinet and they surrendered his welfare to God and they placed him in the Nile River. And guess who directed the float of that little bassinet, right? Enormous faith from his parents. After a peril-filled float, the Lord directed that tiny ark carrying the infant 
right into the house of Pharaoh, the one who wanted to slaughter those babies. Interesting irony. This also brings us to the meaning of Moses' name. Uh, in Hebrew, his name means uh, drawn out or pulled out of specifically water. Okay, And I was thinking about Moses' life. Uh, Moses lived up to the meaning of his name. Number one, uh, Moses is drawn out of water, obviously, as he's born, right? Out of Jochebed's womb. Then, after being placed into the Nile River, the daughter of Pharaoh comes, sees the basket, and she draws Moses back out of the water and into the house of Pharaoh himself. Then later on, by faith, is there another significant event that happens with water in Moses' life? Right, yeah, multiple times, right? He turns the Nile River to blood. How about the Red Sea, right? He draws the people through and out of the Red Sea by faith. Finally, by faith, when Moses is wandering in the desert with Israel, he drew water out of a rock twice while the Israelites wandered in the desert. So, let's think about this for a second. Why does the Lord save Moses' life? Why did God orchestrate and guide the faith of Amram and Jochebed, his parents? Why did Pharaoh's daughter uh, decide to bathe in the Nile River that day? Because God had a call on Moses' life from birth. God knew his plan for Moses before he was ever born. And I was thinking about it. God orchestrated the salvation and the preservation and the training of his chosen leader to lead his people out of Egypt to the land that he promised long ago to Abraham. And the Lord was going to keep his promise of deliverance and Moses was going to be his tool. And I was thinking about it in regards to us. Uh, God had a plan for Moses' life and he certainly has a plan for our life as well. The Bible clearly states that none of us exist by accident, male or female, none of us exist by accident. Before you were born, God molded you inside the waters of your mother's womb. We read about it in Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16. It says this, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. Notice how he doesn't say, horrible are your works. Sometimes we look at our lives and we think, oh God, you messed up. No, he didn't. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. God knit Chris together inside his mother's womb, and he has a plan for your life. Every single one of us. It wasn't just random nonsense. God at work in the mysterious, inside your mother's womb, forming you, creating you, shaping you, giving you your gender, giving you purpose and a plan. The Lord also said it this way uh, to his young prophet at the time, Jeremiah, in chapter 1, verses 4 through 9. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. That means set apart for a purpose. I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I don't know how to speak. I'm only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Don't say, I'm only a youth. For to all to whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Don't be afraid of them, for I'm with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand, and he touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I've put my words in your mouth. I hope that sounds familiar, because God had a calling for Moses. And God had a calling for Jeremiah. And God has a calling for us too, every single one of us. You don't just exist to eat, breathe, and sleep, and live. 
God made you in his image and he has a plan for you to live out here on earth that reflects him, not you. That's his agenda. He wants you to live a life that reflects him to a world that's watching that is enslaved in sin. He's called you to be his deliverer. Even today, God is placing as we sit right here, he's placing his words in our mouth so that we can share them with those who are longing to be delivered from darkness. I was thinking about it. It's God's word in our mouth to the oppressed and to the oppressors. Whether it's to Israel or Pharaoh, it's God's word in our mouth. In the book of Exodus chapter 2, the Bible teaches us that Moses spent 40 years, his first 40 years, as the favored, pampered, educated, trained prince, son of, of Pharaoh. And during that time, the apostle Stephen told us in Acts chapter 7 verse 22, Jen, if you'd read that for us, this is what Stephen says about what was going on in Moses' life for the first 40 years. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was powerful in speech and in action. Okay? However, somewhere along the way, even though he's being raised Egyptian, somewhere along the way, Moses was told of his true identity as a Hebrew, as an Israelite. It probably occurred early in his childhood, after Pharaoh's daughter hired Moses' mom to be his nanny. Okay? So... Plenty of opportunity there for her to be faithful to implement. I was thinking about this. It's really cool. She was faithful to implement this parental wisdom from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7, long before the hand of her son ever wrote it down. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. His mother put that into practice before it was ever written down. Now, God has a calling on your life, on my life. Now, I'm not sure if God's called you to be president. He might not have called you to be a father or a mother or an entrepreneur, or a laborer at the mill. I don't know, but I do know this. <clears throat> Christ has called um, his kids to do something very specific. And if you're here and you've placed your faith in Christ, this, there is no one who is exempt. God has called you to share the message. Share Jesus with family. Share Jesus with friends. Share Jesus with the rulers of the day. Share Jesus with your nation. How can we know that God has placed this calling on our lives? Well, Jesus himself made it very, very plain. Chris, would you read Matthew chapter 4, verse 19 for us, please? Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. Read it one more time. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. Did Jesus say, come follow me, and hopefully somewhere, maybe along the way? You might become a fisher of man? Is that what he said? No, he says, if you're a follower of him, what has he made you? So, it's just a question of whether or not we're fishing or not. Do you fish for men? Do you fish for women? Do you share the life-changing message of Jesus Christ with those around you? Like Moses, it's your calling. God has this calling on every single believer in Jesus Christ on the face of the earth. No one is exempt. God wants you and me to act like Moses in this regard. We're going to look more closely at how God called Moses at the burning bush the next time we're together. But for now, I'm curious what, what you would say. Will we be like Isaiah when he heard God's call and said, Here am I, send me? Or will it be, Here am I, send somebody else? Now, if we're honest... As human beings, unfortunately, we, we tend to err on the other side, right? It's, oh, yeah, Lord, here am I, but mm, somebody else. Now, in our day and age, I was thinking about it. We have more access to share the message of Jesus Christ with those around us than in any other generation in human history. 
It's as simple as sharing this teaching on Facebook or on YouTube with friends and family. It's as simple as sharing a verse that you enjoyed with somebody via text. It's as simple as sharing a podcast that you enjoyed listening to with someone else or a teaching that you enjoyed on, online or on YouTube. It's as simple as asking someone, how, how can I pray for you? And then actually taking the time to pray for them. It's better yet, it's even as simple as inviting them to come with you to church. Now, I was thinking about it. Uh, nobody forced anybody, so far as I know. Maybe some kids might say, oh, yeah, I was forced. But I don't know. Nobody was forced to be here today, right? There's thousands of other places that you could be right now. But by faith, you chose to come here. By faith, you enjoy drawing closer to God uh, as He loves you through His amazing Word as we spend time in it. So then my encouragement is, then by faith, invite those around you to come too. If it's, if it's enjoyable enough and valuable enough for you to be here, then certainly it's enjoyable and valuable for other people that are out there who might not yet know. Now, I want to make this clear. I have no desire for the purpose of building this church or expanding this church body. I'm not a big fan of big church growth plans. What I want to see is I want to see people who don't yet know Jesus Christ come to know and understand Him, and we expand the worldwide body of Jesus Christ. And if they come here, great. If they go somewhere else, I don't care. But that they would come to know and understand what Jesus says in this book, that they would be liberated from the slavery and the bondage that they're all living in, unbeknownst to them, just like we lived. But somebody told us, Somebody was like Moses and came and spoke to us. We need to do that with other people. It's God's calling on our life. Um, also, later on in Moses' story, um, one day, the Bible tells us, as a 40-year-old prince of Egypt, Moses is wandering around, and he's at one of the numerous work projects that's going on, and he observes an Egyptian taskmaster beating one of his fellow Hebrew slaves senseless, and Moses took the plan of God into his own hands and he made an absolute mess of it, right? Moses struck down the Egyptian and he murdered him in cold blood. We read about it in Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. It says this, One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and he looked on their burdens and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, making sure nobody was watching, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and he hid him in the sand. Not a great hiding place, the sand. But anyway, he hid him there. And you read this story and you're like, well, what? What's going on? Well, I believe that Moses had faith. This isn't a faith issue, but he's saying, okay, God, yeah, I've got faith, but not your timing. I'm going to take what you think you want me to do, and I'm going to take it in my hands, and I'm going to do it my way. Okay? Okay. Uh, let me read again back in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24. By faith, it says, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So Moses is like, man, I can't live like this anymore. I'm not, I don't want to be known as an Egyptian. I'm going to identify with God's people. Choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. And I was thinking about it for us in our day and age. We can want to do the right thing for the wrong reasons. Right? Or we can want to do the right thing, but we do it the wrong way. Well, this is Moses going on right now. Hebrews tells us Moses' actions were motivated by faith, even though the implementation of his behavior was terribly misguided. In that terrible moment, Moses made an essential choice. He'd rather be known as a child of God than as a prince of Egypt. Not only that, but he considered being persecuted as a Hebrew and identifying with his future Messiah of greater wealth than enjoying the tangible fleeting pleasures of sin in Egypt. Now, at this point, Moses is valuing a Messiah, a deliverer, who will come 1,600 years later of more value than all of the daily benefits that he must have had as a prince of Egypt. Think about what Moses leaves behind. It's crazy. What about us? 
I was thinking about it. Do we sometimes want to do the right thing, but we're impatient and we run ahead of God? I know I do. Right? Maybe you think like, oh, I really feel like the Lord wants me to do X, Y, Z. And then rather than be patient in the process, we're out there. We're way out over the top of our skis, right? Making a mess of things. How much value do we place, though, on following Christ? Are we willing to endure the persecution of those pharaohs here on earth who reject the good news of Jesus and seek to cause us hurt? That's the kind of world that we're living in more and more, even in our own nation. Is being known as a man or a woman of God more important to us than fitting in here, in this sinful world, with sinful motives? But it does, this world does offer tangible temporary benefits, right? If you want to fit in with this world, you can fit in. And you can sacrifice your faith in the Lord in the process. But you can fit. But is it worth it? Do we value more highly the Lord and God's call on our lives? Uh, Paul said it this way in the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ and what? For to me, to live is Christ and die is gain. Paul was like Moses. He was sold out. Paul later in the same book in Philippians wrote this, Philippians 3.8, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I have suffered the loss of all things and I count them as rubbish. The word rubbish here in the the Greek really means dung, sewage. Okay? All things and I count them as sewage or rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. What's more important to you? Fitting in with what society says or what God says? Fitting in in this this culture in which we live, which this Egyptian culture that we live in here in the United States right now, or following Jesus Christ? What's more important to you? Moses sold out. He didn't sell out to the highest bidder. He didn't sell out to even satisfy himself. By faith, Moses sold out for the Lord. And will we, are, are we, In Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 1, it says these incredible words about Moses. Moses, the man of God. The God who creates us wants each of us to live in the same lifestyle. What's your reputation? How do we want to be known? When people stand at your gravesite, what will you be remembered for? Will it be Vanessa, woman of God? Linda, woman of God. Tom, man of God. Pete, man of God. Eric, man of God. What's going to be our reputation? What's going to be said about us? How are we going to live? The God who creates us wants us to live for Him. Will we live in such a way that Jesus will say of us, the Bible says, in Matthew chapter 25, verse 21, well done, good and faithful servant. (laughs) Pharaoh heard about what was going on with Moses when he murdered that guy, and he sought to kill Moses. So Moses fled the land of his birth, and he hid in the land of Midian. Now, with that one fateful decision, Moses left behind 40 years as a prince in exchange for 40 years as a shepherd. That's not much of a promotion, right? That's a serious demotion, okay? But after 40 years, caring for his father-in-law's herd, Moses had an encounter with the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, and his encounter that he had with the Lord altered the course of the world altered the course of the world. We're going to dive deeper into that calling when we're together again. But as we close out today, I just want to encourage you. By faith, Moses believed God had a plan for his life. Do you believe that God has a plan for your life too? Also, by faith, Moses valued following the Lord more than the material things of this world and fitting in. What about us? Rick, would you be willing to come up front and Jason and Ryan, please? 
We're going to take communion here in a moment. And as we get ready for that, Casey, could you go ahead and stop the live stream for me? Yeah. Thanks. As we get ready to do that, I was thinking about the life of Jesus Christ. 